Hi, I'm Chris Robertson, Master Instructor for Best Incorporated. In this video, I will highlight the major changes from the IPC Huama A620 Revision D to the Revision E of that same document. As with any revision update released from IPC, Revision E had typographical updates and corrections, some grammatical updates to correct and clarify some of the criteria, as well as some format changes. The format changes took the form of some new figures, figures moved on the page, as well as some pages moved, combined, or split simply for layout clarity. An addition aimed at user convenience was the addition of paragraph titles to the referenced pages. For example, in Revision D, a reference may have simply been C4.8.2.3. In Revision E, the same reference will read C4.8.2.3 terminals, bifurcated, lead wire placement, staked, constrained wires. Another change is the removal of the mini table of contents from the beginning of each section. Users may have found these useful in previous revisions, but the decision was made that a single source of content information was desired, rather than multiple table of contents. There is a main table of contents at the beginning of the document, and that should be used to reference any portion of the document. Throughout the standard, documents referenced for more information have been removed, added, or updated, so there the user will see corresponding updates in paragraph 2 applicable documents. There have also been some paragraph title changes. For example, paragraph 3 was titled Preparation. In revision D, the title changed to Wires, modifying the expectation of the section to show that the criteria are not about all preparation of everything, but focuses on the preparation of the wires for inclusion in the assemblies. The first technical change we see is in paragraph 1.1, the scope of the document. There is a new appendix, Appendix D, that was added to give some X-ray guidelines. Appendix D is not extensive. It's mainly an answer to the industry question on using X-ray inspection of the harnesses. In summary, the appendix gives high-level guidelines to the selection and use of X-ray in the inspection process. The use of X-ray and the criteria in the evaluation of X-ray images are outside the scope of this document, as the 620 is purely a visual assessment of the harness. If X-ray is used, the individuals carrying out the X-ray inspection should be proficient in the tasks to be completed. Appendix D notes that certification to the NAS 410 is not applicable to the X-ray inspection of cables and therefore is not required. The appendix goes on to state that the X-ray can be useful in some situations, but is limited in the applicability to general inspection of in-process or manufacturing inspection. It can be useful in process qualification and in failure analysis. Finally, the recommendation written is that the X-ray should not be used in the evaluation of solder cups. Voiding is common on these devices. There's no current evidence that voiding in a cup terminal is a failure mechanism. If the finished connection meets the visual quality criteria, the item is acceptable. Moving to paragraph 1.5, there is an update that slightly modifies the automatic defects. Previously, it was stated that a defect for class 1 is a defect for class 2 and for class 3, and a defect for 2 is automatically a defect for class 3. The updated criteria adds, unless otherwise stated, a defect for 1 is a defect for 2 and 3, etc. This small change reinforces the concept that the customer contracts, drawings, engineering documentation always take precedence over the standard. The customer should get what the customer wants, even if it conflicts with the standard, when the conflicting desire is documented. A statement has been added that line drawings and images can be exaggerated. This is not a new concept in the IPC standards in general, but it brings the 620 in line with other documents. Paragraph 1.5.1.4, previously entitled Combined Conditions, has been removed. In paragraph 1.8, there has been the addition of wire diameter statements. Again, these are not new dimensions used in the document, but it's the first time all three have been included in the definitions section. The definition of wire diameter remains the same as previously stated, the diameter of the wire including the insulation. Conductor diameter is defined as the diameter of the conductive portion of the wire or lead, whether the conductor is a solid conductor or a stranded filament conductor. Finally, strand diameter is the diameter of an individual filament used in a twisted wire conductor. 
Paragraph 1.9 is our next step, where a new hard requirement has been established. In Revision D, where the flowdown of the application of the 620 document was unclear, the recommendation was for the manufacturer to define the flowdown. The new requirement removes ambiguity. Where the flowdown is unclear, the understanding shall be established between the manufacturer and the user. The next relatively minor change is in Table 1-2 of the magnification aids. In Revision D, there were two lines, one for cleanliness, with or without a cleaning process, and one for no clean processes. The criteria were identical, and it didn't really make sense to have them split out. Whether or not you clean the boards or use what the marketing people have chosen to call a no clean process, the use of magnification for inspection for cleanliness is not required. In 1.15.2, a correction referencing an old document was updated. The document ANSI NCSL Z540-1 was withdrawn back in 2007 as an active standard. The change from referencing the Z540 to the ISO IEC 17025 standard for testing calibration laboratories has been made. As noted in the introduction of this video, paragraph 2 was updated to list all document titles for referenced materials within the 620E. Section 3 has had the previously mentioned title change, but the criteria remains the same as in Revision D. Our next criteria modification comes in Section 4.1.1.1.1, where the statement of specific silver content for tin lead silver alloys has been moved out of the note for Table 4-1. The criteria have not been modified, but the practice of having requirements in a table note is not allowed in standardized criteria documents. This is simply a correction of an oversight from previous revisions. In Section 4.1.1.5, Material, Components, and Equipment requires for tools and equipment to be selected and maintained such that no damage to the assembly happens to the assembly has been removed. This doesn't signal a change in the criteria. You still can't do anything that would damage the cables or harness assembly, but the statement was redundant to section 1.15. Appendix C remains as guidelines for tools and equipment. 4.3.2.1 previously allowed exposed basis metal on wire or lead ends. This restrictive requirement conflicted with other sections of the document, which allowed exposed basis metal if it didn't exceed the damage limits or cause the connection to fail. The new statement is more encompassing, allowing exposed metal as indicated in other sections of the standard. Removing ambiguity seems to be somewhat of a theme for revision E of the 620. The next instance is in 4.5.2, where previously we saw that slight melting of the wire installation was allowed. A long-standing question to the committee was, what do you mean by slight? Revision E defines the acceptable and defect condition in a relationship to the percentage of reduction. Up to 20% reduction in the insulation thickness is acceptable. More than 20% of the thickness of the insulation is a defect. Section 4.6 has been updated to allow for different sizes and configurations of terminations. Revision D required a specific distance between the shrink sleeve and the connector entering the assembly. A new figure, figure 415, has been added that shows a situation where the opening of the terminal is nearly in contact with the connector insert. The intent of the criterion is that the sleeve extends past the soldered connection and does not interfere with any compliant or floating inserts where movement is required. Paragraph 4.8, Terminals, has added a recommendation. Since the 620 is a process document, guidance for the placement of wires and leads on the terminals is appropriate. The recommendation is that when both components and wire leads are used on a terminal, the component leads should be placed near the topmost portion of the terminals to facilitate component replacement. Another change that doesn't really change the criteria but does add clarity of the criteria is in 4.8.2.1 and a corresponding change in 4.8.2.3. Regarding wires and leads routed straight through from the side of a bifurcated terminal, the acceptable condition of 4.8.2.1, the millimeter size of 0.75 millimeters greater than or equal to or greater than 0.75 millimeters of the wire routed straight through the bifurcated terminal has been removed, leaving only the wire gauge. It looks like the same change was not made to the defect section where the millimeter dimensions of the wire are still present. 
As noted, the same change has been made in Table 4-6. This change does make Notes 1 and 2 redundant, but that may just be a typo. A comment has been submitted to the committee for update at the time of this video. Much of Section 5, the criteria of crimped terminations, remains unchanged. There has been an update to the CMA recommendations to make it more specific and to add figures with examples of different methods of CMA buildup. One minor change is in Section 5.3.4, where the conditions of the wire not being secured in the crimp and any visible fractures have been moved from defect for 2 and 3 to defect for all classes 1, 2, and 3. Paragraphs 6 and 7 remain unchanged. In a major rearranging of the criteria and an effort to remove duplicated criteria, all the sleeving requirements for splices have been removed from the individual splice sections and moved into a new section, 8.4, sleeving over splices. All the sleeving criteria remains the same. Section 9, connectorization, remains the same. Section 10, overmolding, potting, has a few changes. The first change is that Table 10-1, the definitions of molding and potting visual anomalies, has been removed. The criteria of the remainder of the section are mostly the same. A small clarification is found in Section 10.1.3, overmolding flashing. Previously, flashing up to 0.75 mm was considered acceptable, but there was no corresponding defect. This made the allowance essentially a should or recommendation. In Revision E, flashing up to 0.75 mm is now a process indicator if it does not interfere with the mechanical or electrical function. There is still no defect condition for flash in excess of 0.75 mm. The last change in Section 10 is for the overmolding of flexible flat ribbon cables in 10.3. There's no longer a requirement for parallel wires if the wires do not cross over each other. The corresponding defect is for wires that do cross over within the ribbon material. Paragraphs 11 through 18 remain largely unchanged, save for the addition of some new images. Take a look through these sections to see those new images. An important typo to note is in paragraph 19, Testing. Table 19-12 has some misformatted superscript numbers that change the requirements for the 30 gauge and 28 gauge wire pull force testing. The force limit for 30 gauge wires is currently shown as 1.52 pounds or 6.72 newtons. This isn't a huge difference, but the last two in both statements should be a superscript number two referencing the note in the table. Where this is significant in difference is for the 28 gauge wire. The table shows a limit of 22 pounds and 8.92 newtons. Again, the final two should be superscript. When the twos are corrected, you can see that the value for the 28 gauge wire goes from 22 pounds to 2 pounds. This is a big difference. This error has been submitted to IPC for update. I'm not sure if or how they plan to correct this, but if your company uses this table, it's a very important typo of which to be aware. Section 20, High Voltage Applications, has seen one criteria change. More of a correction than a change, the acceptable condition previously indicated that layering or reflow lines were the same as disturbed solder and were allowed. The clarification corrects that a disturbed solder is always a defect, regardless of the high voltage criteria in use or not. Finally, the appendices did not have significant changes other than the addition of Appendix D, as discussed at the beginning of this presentation. And that's it! My personal opinion is that there were no major production-shattering changes from revision D to E. Most of your production can likely go on with little or no changes because of the release of revision E. For those interested in the training and certification for the 620E, the training slides have been updated and are available for training and use. As you can see, not a lot of change has taken place between revision 620D and revision 620E. Take a look throughout to see if your company needs to update to the newest revision. I'm Chris Robertson. Thanks for watching. Visit and follow us on our YouTube channel, Soldering Geek, for more videos. For training classes, supplies, and more, visit our website, www.solder.net.